speaking of skills, I want to introduce you to Michelle Alexander, Lieutenant Colonel Michelle Alexander. I've known Michelle since about 2006, and uh, she was at that time running the recruiters for the Alabama National Guard, Alabama Army National Guard. Recruiters, I think, from medical. I think, was that right? Medical? I think I was from medical JAG. Chaplain. Medical JAG, yeah. So uh, I've known Michelle for a long time. During that time, she has held many, many positions within the National Guard, which she can talk about. Uh, she's an amazing woman, and now she told me she wants to retire to grow mushrooms. <laughs> I mean, come on! You know anybody wants to grow mushrooms? Michelle, what? You want to grow mushrooms? Wait, like, what kind of mushrooms do you want to grow? Because that was my first question I asked. There's so many different kinds. I bet there is. Some are better than others. Just saying, I bet there's a lot of kinds. How would you know there's so many different kinds, by the way, unless you've tried? Okay, medical marijuana, whatever it is. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I want to introduce you to Michelle Alexander. She will be talking about uh, the Alabama Army National Guard and some other uh, things going on. There you go, Michelle. Thank you very much. There. And Michelle is green. <laughs> What's that supposed to mean? There's no picture. <laughs> <laughs> Out of view picture. You see me, right? Um, all right, so Lieutenant Colonel Michelle Alexander. I'm actually with the Alabama Army National Guard um, full time. Um, I'm in my 26th year in the National Guard, but um, January will be my 20th year, so I can retire um, in 2023. Um, if you notice something, I may look a little different. Then the rest of the presenters in here, I get to wear earrings. <laughs> so um, just with that, just a little diversity here, but I'm just going to kind of talk you through military in general, structure, terms, stuff like that. So it's very generalized of um, what I want to give you, because maybe you don't have any background, or maybe you don't know any military. And if you are on the hiring end, then it helps if someone gives you that resume to see and understand maybe what they're talking about to understand the transition life because it is a little bit difficult for us to go from our language into a civilian language you know even with my husband now when i speak he looks at me funny like i don't know what you're talking about i have no idea so but uh, just in general terms <clears throat> things that we're going over today of course like I said a little vocabulary lesson um, structure and branches of the military active duty versus National Guard and Reserve there is a little bit of difference there education training and a promotion process and then a little bit about who are today's service members all right so vocabulary lesson so IDT you may hear me say IDT it's inactive duty training. So basically that's what Guard and Reserve members do. So the whole drill weekend that we talk about, that's our inactive duty training. When we become active duty, so which if we're deployed or we go on some type of training event, then that's when we become on active order. So when you see this, that's kind of what it means. Um, MOS, Military Occupational Specialty, that's what we use um, Army, uh, I believe the Marines uses the MOS also. You have the AFSC, Airborne Specialty Code, um, AIT or A School. So this is where a lot of times that's where we learn what we're going to do. So you have basic training and then you have AIT. We'll go through that a little more. If someone has something and they list themselves as an NCO, it is a non commissioned officer. Um, I'll go a little more into this, and, and you all have kind of what I call my vocabulary words, uh, acronyms on your as handouts just to keep those and if you ever need it um, annual training that's what we call our two-week training that we do drill again that's our little weekend training and a unit so that's the place that we belong to so when you hear us talk about units that is the smaller group so we have the army national guard as a whole but we're all broke down into smaller groups called units all right, so let's talk about the branches themselves. Um, so in, in simple terms, it's called the U.S. Armed Forces, made up of six branches, right? So first you have the Air Force. The Air Force also has the Air Reserve. The Air Force, of course, protects the American interests at home and abroad with a focus on air power. So that's the main thing that you'll get out of there. The next one is the Army, and the Army also has the Reserves. 
They're the oldest branch of the U.S. military. They protect the security of the United States. They dominate land power, where the Air Force dominates air, we dominate land. You have the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard Reserve. Um, those are the ones that have maritime force. So a lot of times you'll see those law enforcement, humanitarian regulations. So we do have those because we do have a coastline. Um, and then you have the Marine Corps. Of course, those are always the first on the ground in combat. Um, they're known as the world's fiercest warriors. So, and, and they pride themselves in that. And I appreciate them as the Army to be in front of me. <laughs> um, and you have the Navy and the Navy Reserves. Of course, those are our combat ready naval forces that are out there. They secure the air in the sea. Um, and then our new one, the Space Force. So I don't know how many people know that we actually have that now. Um, the Space Force defends the U.S. interest on land, air, and orbit um, of advanced training technology. Right now, to get into the Space Force, you actually have to go through the Air Force. <laughs> so they kind of hold pride in that. But eventually, those will go away, I'm sure, and the Space Force will become on their own. Um, in this, we also have the National Guard. Only two branches have the National Guard, and that's the Army and the Air. So all other branches have reserves, but we have the National Guard. All right, so active duty versus reserves. So um, an active duty person is a person um, that works full time. So those will usually be your people that have this uniform on full time. I'm active, but I'm active guard. So that's what you may hear me talk about. Um, they work full time, and then you have people who are in the reserve in the National Guard. So those are your part time individuals. The reserve usually as a whole, and the way to kind of tell the difference in these sometimes is the reserves takes the place of active duty. So let's just say that someone deploys or a unit deploys off an active duty base. The reserves will usually backfill them to do some type of training um, as a whole. The difference in the reserves and then the National Guard is the National Guard handles more of your domestic operations. So I'm sure everyone has seen, because you live in Alabama, whether it's been a hurricane, a tornado, any type of events like that, that's when we get called up because we have what they call a dual status. We not only work for the federal government, but we also work for the state. So the governor can actually call us up to assist with our communities. We have a wide variety of things that we can do, equipment, and that's what we're here for. So especially for me as the National Guard, that was one of the reasons I joined the National Guard was to be a part of my community because that was important to me that I could help out the people that were around me. All right, so let's talk a little bit about training. So there's different types of training. So you have basic training is maybe what you call it. Um, and with basic training, usually it lasts for eight to 13 weeks. So when you go to basic training, when a recruit goes to basic training, that's when they're really learning, and they call it the basics. So that's where you're learning a lot of times um, marching, physical fitness. Um, there's a lot of discipline there reason is they're trying to get you used to structure. You may come out of an environment that maybe doesn't have a lot of structure in it. So they're teaching you structure. Um, they're getting you ready for that next step. Um, there is weapons handling in it. Uh, just all types of military skills. So once you do that at 18 to 13 weeks, and that's across all branches, you kind of go through that. You go through your basic course. Your second course that you usually go through is your military training. That's your advance, okay? So your advanced training is where you learn what you're going to be. So let's say you're going to be a maintenance person, and that's where you learn how to work on the vehicles. Maybe you've never even touched a wrench or know what a wrench is. At this time, but you chose to go maintenance because that was the interest of you. This is where you learn the basics of your skills. Medics, plumbers, carpenters, Public affairs personnel. There's a wide variety, but the advanced training is where you do that. Then we have your um, additional skills type training, okay? And then from there, you go into specialized training. So maybe you're a medic for special forces, or maybe you're a mechanic for a special forces unit. When you do that, then you learn something a little bit more different. Maybe you work on radios. 
And in that case, you may want a different type of radio. Um, and then, you know, you may be basic and signal. And then you may go work where you repair drones. I mean, there's just a wide variety of things, but you always have that next step. There's always more training in the military. You have your basics that you learn, but you always are up in your skill level. All right, so a military occupational code. That's what we call it with what we are. So me, you could say I've been in transportation, I've been in logistics, and I've been in personnel. So that's kind of the variety that I have. So my MOS, and so if you see this on somebody's application, that is their occupational code. There's plenty of websites out there that if somebody happens to put that, and you don't know exactly what it is that they do, you can just kind of Google it and look up and see what they do. But that's how we kind of, I guess you could say, identify ourselves of what we are. It's usually a five-digit code that's out there. It means a lot to us, but probably doesn't mean that much to you. All right, let's talk about who's today's soldiers. So today's soldiers joined after 9-11. So they never really knew what peacetime was, okay? The ones that are retiring now or coming into the workforce, that's all they've ever known. That's all the society that they've already, that they've known. They're technically savvy, okay? They understand the internet, the technical abilities that you have to have. Their goal is to always improve that part of what we do. So they understand that. Diverse and inclusive. Um, and a lot of people think that's not what the military is, but it is very diverse. It is a population or a section from society. So we represent all types of diversity. We have inclusion. We are a big part of that. You have to, you don't judge the people next to you. Everybody is included and it's a part of what we do. We are a unit, we are cohesive. We work as a team. You are taught from the beginning to work as a team. So that's part of what we do. Mission oriented. Everything we talk about is having a goal, having a task, something that we have to do or want to do either one and that's that's including in education that's including in our specialty and that's just including in life we have a big mentorship and sponsorship programs we are always encouraging and pushing each other so if you were to get somebody that has been in the military you're going to find them very focused so if you give them a task their goal is to complete that task sometimes they'll ask questions along the way. Sometimes you can straight up just give them that task and they will take off with it. So that's what you get. You don't have someone which you may have to call babysit. So that's, we want to get the task complete. That's where we're focus is. Innovative. We always have to be innovative in the military. Sometimes that's to get out of what we're trying to do or to get into something that we want to do. We're flexible. There's, you know, we always say there's always constant change. That's just part of how we are. Although, like he said, we may seem rigid. It's not rigid, it's structure. But in that structure, we have to be very flexible. We have to be patient because somebody may give us guidance or something to do and we have that term, hurry up and wait. So you may be told to do something but you're consistently waiting on something else. But we're resilient in that part of it. And the ones that are retiring now, they wanna be a part of something bigger. So in the, mo the mission oriented, in the focus that they want to do, they want to improve something. Um, they're not as much to this monotonous task. They want to see what they've done. They want to have results of what they've done. So that's very important to military members in general um, and veterans, but especially this newer generation that's coming out. They want to be a part of something bigger than themselves. A lot of times that's why they joined. We had the 9-11, that's what they've seen. They've seen wartime and they want to be a part of that. If they joined the National Guard, they might have seen when a tornado comes through or when something has happened. They want to be a part of that. So they, again, they want to be something bigger than themselves. 
So let's talk about what else they may bring to the table. So you have hard skills. So, and that's something that we may or may not talk about what we want because a lot of people have hard skills. So, you know, maybe I do know how to turn a wrench. Maybe I do know how to type fast, do memos, um, public affairs, do journalists, any of that type stuff. I guarantee you there's not hardly a job that you could tell me right now that the military cannot come out and do or has had some type of training in it. And that's even to the basic of just doing leadership training or just having an initiative. Sometimes that's a big piece of what you want right now. It's just someone who has something, some kind of talent. Um, but you know, we have, there is a variety between Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. There's always something that one of us can contribute to whatever job it may be. So the next thing you want, of course, is soft skills. Okay, leadership. From the very beginning to include basic training, you are put in positions of leadership. So that's a 17, sometimes 18 year old person who was put in charge of other individuals. They are learning how to lead, how to take charge. Work under pressure. Um, as we all know that we get, they sleep deprived us sometimes, and we all know that. And, you know, sometimes the food may not be the best in the world if anybody's had an MRE. Um, you understand that. You, uh, some of us in the Army and the Marines, not the chair, chair force, I mean Air Force, um, go into the field. So you have environments where you're doing that. Um, they like to put you on, under pressure to see how you will respond because you, if you were ever in an event that you have to respond, you need to know how your mind is going to act during that time how you're going to respond when the pressure is on. Do you crumble? And in that case, and sometimes they do, sometimes we all do, but then you teach resiliency, teach them how to pick themselves back up and move forward. So that's a skill that you want, not someone who goes and cries in the corner because you got on to it. I have Jimmy Walt Twins, that's all I do right now. Um, and they did communication and goal setting. Again, that comes back to being mission oriented. There's always a goal in mind. There's always a next step. Um, even when a project is complete, it's a next step. What is my next project? What is my next task? So there's always something we want to do. Eager to learn, eager to grow. Um, organization. Um, part of the, what you may call rigidity or structure, if you choose to use it that way, is that we're organized. So there is a process, and one of the things I, I holler out all the time is, in the meetings, is there's a process for that. Um, and you know, you can't go make all the make all can say that too, because there's always a process. So that's how our minds work. There's, it's a step. It's a step process. And that's what we want to see. And a lot of times, if you don't have that in place, we will develop it for you. <laughs> and that's one of the things, that one of those, I am a process-minded person. So if you don't have a, something that you continually operate off of, that's what we do. We'll come in and we'll be like, okay, step one, step two, step three. That's what we want to see and that's what we want to do. So we can also help in that problem solving. Okay, um, that's just in general, something that we're tasked with. We have events in the military where um, you have obstacles that you have to get over or some type of event that you have to do and you have to solve the problem. And it's uh, really interesting because we have courses, leadership courses that we do. And during that course, you may have three pieces of wood and a barrel, and they'll tell you to cross a waterway. So you have to go together as a team um, and, you know, and figure out how to do it. And maybe putting one board on top of the other and then figure it out. And then most of the time, there's at least one person that falls in the water, but you learn. But you have to learn to solve the problem. No matter what you're doing, solve the problem. And then, of course, creativity and collaboration. We like to think out of the box. Um, you may think that's not a trait that a military person does because it's got to be black and white in this line. But then a lot of times, we are very creative people. And again, sometimes that's for me to get out of stuff, uh, you know, or to create you another opportunity. But we are creative. Again, we are a sample of society in what we do. 
All right, just in conclusion, um, I really encourage you, and I, I, spent, I spent 14 years in recruiting, so when I get out, they're gonna call me cuckoo. 14 years out of my 20 years, because nobody does recruiting. That's not what they do. But I have a passion for soldiers. I have a passion for people and want to do something for them to make them better in some form or fashion in their life. And that's, that's the civilian world, that's life, that's just in general. So I encourage you to look closely at those that are in the military. Um, there are 9,000 Army National Guard soldiers. There is around 4,500 Air National Guard soldiers. And then you, overall, for the Guard and the Reserve in the state of Alabama, there are 19,000. So imagine having that as a pool for you to hire somebody from with the skills that I've talked about. That'd be pretty nice to hire those kind of people, wouldn't it? Yes. Do you know what percentage of recently retired and or guard service veterans are actively looking for employment? What percentage of the numbers you just gave us are actively looking? So there's probably, in, given the years, depends on um, when, we, when we kind of come out, but there's probably anywhere from 20% a year that is probably looking for some type. Now, I will tell you this, and, and Anna knows this because and, and the other ones do too, <coughs> The National Guard soldiers, and especially our younger soldiers, are underemployed. I consistently, when I was in recruiting, tried to bring um, hirees on. Um, I would work with skills um, personnel, uh, the uh, Building Alabama. I would work with their organization. I worked with Alabama Power. I worked with several to come in to try to help them get jobs. Um, so you not, that's the good thing about the Guard and Reserve. They're not just looking for retirees. These are people who need jobs mm -hmm. every day. You know, um, Did you say underemployed? They are underemployed, yes. So, and I say that because sometimes their skills are not known. And, and, and I bet several of you can be honest with this. In the past 20 years, the environment we've been in with employments. People are scared to hire National Guard Reserve members because they are scared to lose them for that year or for the months for training. So small businesses, if they pay a price when they do that, but hopefully we are trying to get the understanding that there still is a benefit there. It's not like we are called out for next week that we're leaving for a year for next week. There is a lead time there, sometimes six months, sometimes a year, depending on what type of environment we're in. <clears throat> so it's not like we're going to take them tomorrow. That's not how we work. There can be plans made for what we do. So again, if you see somebody that's in the military, in the guard, in the reserves, or coming out of the guard, coming off active duty, we have five active duty posts in the state of Alabama, from Air Force to Army, even down to Coast Guard. So you have people, if they choose to stay in Alabama, um, like the general said, in regards to location, I could do to travel around a lot, so maybe they want to stay in Alabama, maybe they don't, but you have a low cost of living here. So their retirement dollars, <laughs> as any of the retirees know, will go a little further in Alabama than if they decide to go park in California. But again, a lot of times that comes to where family is and where they feel at home. But again, there's a huge pool out there for you to choose from if you get into the right thing. So this Guild Bridge program is coming up, the CSP that's coming up. This is getting us like veterans and those in the military an opportunity to see what's out there, how to develop our skills, how to transition our skills to the civilian world so that we understand what you're looking for and what you need and how we fit into your puzzle. Because it's just very important that we, we have to have that sense of purpose. That's really big for us in the military. We really need that sense of purpose. And we love to work. That is really part of what we do. There are gonna be some 
that are in our Middle East just as there are in society, because we do want to work. We want to be a part of it. So part of doing that is talking to recruiters, saying, hey, we know somebody. Maybe that's the reason they got into the guard. Maybe they lost their job. Maybe they need another job. So it's just an opportunity to talk to any of us about it, work with the veterans programs that you're going to hear today. And I promise you, it'll be a great experience for you to get those people, get them on board, get them moving, and it's a network. You know, all of us right here, <laughs> we all know each other from pass across somewhere. You have access to so many more when you do this. So just take that, take that leap of faith, um, get that better on <coughs> board, get that soldier that is in or green or anybody else, and let's go from there. Any other questions for me? There's stuff that's over there, so um, just some books and pens and lanyards and um, just a few little goodies if anybody's interested in anything. Um, and I'm always available. Thanks, Thank you, Alex.